On our show today, we have the pleasure of interviewing two influential role models in the lifestyle community. This couple has created a business dedicated to providing people with advice, knowledge, and support to aid them in their lifestyle journey. You can find them on YouTube, attending lifestyle events around the world, or visiting one of their four clubs in the United States. Please welcome John and Jackie Melfi from Open Love 101 to our show. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Hello. Thank you for coming on to the show today. Thanks so much for having us on here. Yeah. So you guys recently took a trip to Italy. How was that? Awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was it was incredible. We had a, just a great time. I don't know how you can go to Italy and not have a good time. Yeah. I, I think John was like a travel agent in his other life. He <laughs> loves to plan these things. And I love him planning them. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. <laughs> we had such a great time. We got to have our anniversary, watch a Formula One race, do some relaxing, some tourist stuff. I don't know. All we rode on a lot of boats. We did. That's in awesome. Venice and also on Lake Como. So. Oh, that sounds magical. We're like backwards. I'm the planner, usually, the travel, yeah. the travel agent, and he's just along. For the I'm ride. just the talent. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Yeah. <laughs> You're the trophy husband. Yes. I make Excel sheets. <laughs> That's how serious it gets. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a plan. There's a plan. Uh, so um we brought you guys on the show today because you guys have your company Open Love 101. We do. And um based upon that, uh actually I just saw a post. I sorry, my head just went to the Lisa Ling interview that you guys did last year. Oh yeah, year. we can talk about that now. <laughs> yes. I know, finally. Finally. I know that we we've been holding it back. We even said it on one of our shows that it was like a sh secret. We're like we went to do the secret. <laughs> yeah, the secret <laughs> after our uh, Nin uh, our Nin recap episode from last year. So, um yeah, uh, you guys were also on that interview, and um, your clubs in Dallas, Austin, uh, New Orleans, and Houston. 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 Right. Yeah, and so on the interview, uh, they actually came to our home for the weekend. We did an uh, interview here at our house. Uh, we did some B-roll stuff out, you know, having fun shooting shotguns. B-roll. They wanted to get that Texas vibe. Yeah. And then, uh, and then one night they came to our club here in Houston and spoke to a bunch of our members and showed them around. So it was, it was a great experience. And then, as you know, they were in New Orleans for Naughty Novels. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. was a, that was a interesting lot of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what we were signing up for. We <laughs> I couldn't imagine having them come to our house though. Oh my gosh. I'm glad that didn't happen. We avoided that. <laughs> oh, it but it was funny when we were in our room and they were all crammed into like all the audio, the, uh, the background guys yeah. were all crammed in the bathroom. That was yeah. so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's no, you don't realize how much behind the scenes stuff goes on to produce one of those programs. It's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. And like they filmed that, what, like a year and a half in advance as well. Like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely insane. But I think it was for a really good cause. I mean, we haven't seen it yet, but they were definitely approaching it in a very positive light and wanted to put light on to all of the positive things in the lifestyle. And I think that's why they picked you guys, obviously, to come on there. Do you guys mind sharing a little bit more about Open Love, what you guys, what you guys do with the community? No, yeah, of course. So, you know, I I've had swingers clubs for years. And at the time when we launched openlove101.com, I had a club in New Orleans, which is uh, next year will be its 20th year. And then uh, we had just opened Dallas. And, uh, you know, we were, I don't say we were struggling, but we really wanted to find a way to reach new couples that, that might have an interest or curiosity about the swinger lifestyle or open relationships, that kind of a thing. So with our marketing team, we decided to launch openlove101.com to try and reach these people. You know, couples that maybe they'll say things like, I would never go to a swingers club, but they, you know, we're not that way, but they sit at home and they watch porn yeah. and, or they, you know, they play with toys. You know, they're doing things that aren't necessarily, you know, they, maybe they fantasize about threesomes. Uh, so we wanted to reach those couples and that's why we launched it. it. But it has turned into such a great, great company. We, we love it. And, uh, you know, we, we, we provide content every week, either a, a written blog or a video blog where we do stuff like this. 
and or maybe other things like we might share an interview that we've done with someone else. And then Jackie, of course, she answers. We get so many emails every day from people asking questions. And Jackie will share with me something. She'll show me an email and she'll say, can you help me with this one? I've been like, sure. Tell them, just have a good time in life. <laughs> yeah. I just can't tell them. Like, yeah, no, just keep it simple. And she spends three or four hours writing the response to this one question that I would have answered in two sentences. So. No, because, oh, yeah. are, and, and we actually had that happen. Like I brought him this question. I said, you know, what is your opinion on this? He gave this really succinct answer. And that's what I sent her. And she literally wrote back and was like, no. <laughs> that, is not, that, is not, that, that is not gonna work but you know the other thing with open love is you know we we were reaching those people on the fringe of of the lifestyle but in conjunction with that it was an outlet for me because I knew nothing about swinging and so when it came time for me to do some research about swinging because that was John's livelihood it, you know, it was hard for me to find content. It was hard for me to find like what had other people experienced. You know, I grew up super conservative. I grew up, you know, really religious. And so it was, even though I was curious about it and open to like the concept of it, I had no frame of reference. I'm like, I don't know. I'm completely flying blind. So I thought what better way to maybe help other especially women that are new to this than to maybe share my story. And I, I don't mind being an open book. So that was, that was a benefit, not only for other people, but it kind of helped me through my walking through the process was to share. So. Yeah. And that's a much better answer than mine. So <laughs> no, totally. no, I, like why I answer the emails. <laughs> well, we, we have had these conversations before at like meeting each other at Naughty Nolans in 2018. And then we were hanging out with you guys last year as you guys handed off your crowns to us, which is quite funny because we were hanging out before <laughs> and that was really quite funny. We were like literally just hanging around watching things. And then all of a sudden we're up on stage with them anyways. So that was really funny. That was sweet. But, um, the, that's, we've had that conversation cause that's kind of how we started out was not having the information, like looking for it everywhere, being like, okay, what, where do we find information? And then when we decided to do our trip to Hito, um, that's when Tara decided that she wanted to blog about it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's kind of where, that's where we started was like, okay, well, maybe we'll get this information out there and then maybe people gravitate towards it because we're just sharing our journey. People want it. People are very curious about it. And I think the nice thing that you guys have with the clubs is a lot of newbies and a lot of newbie questions. And so you're able, able to tailor a lot of your content towards helping them with very um, like direct questions that they would have, I find. Yes. Like a lot of times your content is a very direct question, but like it's very helpful. It's it's what they those people need and a lot of times i learn from reading your newsletter so Aww. thank you <laughs> that's so great. yay <laughs> i just i love that's what i love about like the sort of like the open like open love and uh, what everybody does is is like they all share just a different perspective of technically the same way of you know being in the lifestyle right like we all talk about the same thing right we all talk about it but we all give our different perspectives and i love your guys's perspective on the lifestyle and jackie of course i love your stories of how it's become so empowering for you and all of that stuff because, because because jackie you didn't start out in lifestyle like you said john was the one that yeah do you guys yeah. mind sharing a little bit more about that Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, I was born in the lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> At least I don't remember from zero to 18, but in 18, I was pretty much in the lifestyle. So, uh, but you didn't call it that. You no. didn't know it had like a name. You just thought you were normal. That's it. I just hung out with people. We'd have group sex and threesomes. It just, it just seemed like that's how, that's how it was. And you know, throughout my younger adult life, I would have girlfriends occasionally um, and it just, to be in that, that really strict relationship models, it, 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 you know, caused me some issues over the years. And, uh, you know, back then I was drinking, so it was, it was easy for me. You know, I can say today, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't in a monogamous relationship anytime I was in a monogamous relationship. It was, it was <laughs> at least uh, me too. Me too. <laughs> she thought we were, and she thought we were. <laughs> and she we um, but you know, today, with, so with the clubs, Jackie and I had gone to high school together, so we knew each other already. 
Mm-hmm. And she reached out to me on Facebook. We were getting ready to go to a, a high school uh, reunion. And I lived in Florida. She lived in Kansas where we grew up in Wichita, Kansas. And she reached out to me. I think we chatted on Facebook for five minutes. And then we're like, let's talk on the phone. And, you know, I'm trolling her pictures. And, you know, I find out after the fact she's trolling mine. And we started talking. We talked that night for hours. Mm-hmm. And then the next night for hours and the next night for hours. So seven nights in a row. And I told Jackie what I did, um, which I learned it was important to do that because there were many times I would go on a date or two or three, and then they would finally ask and I would tell them and that would be the last date. Right. Or, or we would, I would meet the parents and then the next day she'd say, yeah, my parents aren't going to let me date you. I'm like, you're 30 years old. Well, I'm sorry, but I still got to please my parents. Oh well, my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I learned to be really upfront about it. And I was willing to be in a relationship that was monogamous, you know, at, at, at this time in my life, you know, as an adult. And, uh, but Jackie and I talked about it and she decided she wanted to, to try something a little different and, and open the relationship up. So. Yeah, it was, it was like, I was at a point in my life that I was ready for something so outside the box that when he said swinger, even though I didn't really know what that was, I was like, okay, I mean, let's, <laughs> let's talk about this. And it wasn't, you know, here's the thing. It wasn't like I had this opinion about swinging, but I had an opinion about John. I mean, there were qualities that he had that I just really fell in love with. So the, the one interchange that I'd ever, ever had in my entire life with swinging happened to be probably a year before John and I reconnected. And that was, there was this rumor going around that there was this couple within our community that were swingers. And I was like, <laughs> swingers, what is, you know, I, what is that? So, you know, so I looked up, I knew enough to know that this meant that this married couple was having sex with other people. And all I remember thinking was that poor couple, that poor, <laughs> poor couple that they're, you know, they just obviously don't understand the ramifications of marriage. They don't understand commitment. They, you know, all of those things that we talk about uh, negatively about swing, those were the same views that I held. And so when John said, you know, I own swingers clubs, this is after I had gone through my divorce, you know, after, you know, like being super judgy of these swingers, but then my marriage was falling apart, but somehow I was still like more superior than them. I was ready to like, okay, let's see what this, what this is. I really like the qualities in him. So it must not be all that bad because he's a great guy. (laughs) And then on top of that, when we talked about some fantasies, his response was, well, I think we should see about making that a reality. I, I think the top of my head blew off. I'm like, you can't, you can't say that. I mean, we can't make that a reality. What are you talking about? That's a fantasy. <laughs> but he was like, yeah, we can. That's kind of what this is about. This is about you getting to be authentic. Oh boy. I was, I was ready to go down that path. Yeah. That was exciting to me. Yeah. It's like very somebody liberating. was going to let me be me. What the hell are you talking about? Mm-hmm. After, awesome. after years of like being told years. to be somebody else, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. From 18 to 48, I was somebody's wife. So I, or somebody's mother. Right. And all of a sudden somebody was like, what do you want to do? It's like, I don't know. (laughs) You know? And then it it made me realize I didn't know. I, you know, I had, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So he's like, well, let's try some stuff. So we lived in separate States and I was going back and forth between Tampa and Dallas to get the Dallas club open and then seeing Jackie in Wichita. And so we decided the first thing we would try is dating separately. And so Jackie went on a date in Wichita and told me about it. And I went on a date in Florida and told her about it. And so we kind of started our swinger open relationship a little different than most Mm -hmm. people do by Mm -hmm. taking baby steps. We just jumped right in. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of that though. Like we have some couples, um, they don't want to like see each other in the beginning. And so that's like their workaround. And you know what, in most cases it's six, it's successful because they know that's what they want and they're doing what they want. And they want to hear about it. They want to, they want to know almost like the intricate details of well, like, kind everyone. of like not everyone, but most people want to know, like they, they are intrigued about how your date went and kind of what made it joyful for you. Right. Like, cause again, seeing your partner fulfilled and happy is kind of like what most people are in the lifestyle for. So when you get to hear it and see it like through pictures and stuff like that, 
I think that there's like that draw that you get to be able to do that. Did you guys like share everything about everything? We did, but you know, the reason that I didn't, that I was really hesitant initially for us to do anything together was I wasn't sure how I was going to process it. So for me, it, it seemed safer if I went on this date over here and I didn't have to worry about seeing his facial expressions. I didn't have to worry about seeing my facial expressions. Mm -hmm. You know, what if I didn't like it? You know, now I'm trapped in this thing. And, you know, I was afraid I was just going to be too emotionally fragile trying something so outside the box. So if I could kind of do it under this veil of, of solidarity, you know, I could, you know, I could just be by myself and do it. And then I could see how I handled it. And then I could. Then she shared it with me. Absolutely. I'm all, I'm one of those. I want to hear every detail. Yeah. And he loved it. And then that gave me courage. It made me feel like, <laughs> okay, this is okay. This is getting a good response and it's making me feel good. Yeah. Him feel good. So yeah. gives you the confidence. Yeah. Um, John, you said earlier, um, you were not with, when it came to drinking, you were making some bad decisions yeah. in your life. So was this during a point in your life when you were sober, when you met Jackie? Yeah. So I've been sober 30 years. In, okay. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. So it's been okay. a long time and I didn't get into the nightclub business until I'd been sober a couple of years, actually. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And so when you started out in the nightclub business, how was that for you? Obviously you did a transition into the clubs, but into lifestyle clubs, but like in the bar, how was that for you in like understanding your sobriety? So, you know, I struggled with sobriety initially. It was really hard for me to get sober. And I think it will, I know it is for a lot of people. And, uh, but I just became really honest with myself and got, you know, help. I got a sponsor and work the steps. And I really built a good foundation of sobriety. Right. Uh, I was working in advertising, which I had for most of, you know, in my twenties. And it, it, I was really finding it difficult to, to envision myself as successful uh, in that career anymore without drinking. I'm going out with people back then, you know, in the, in the eighties, it wasn't just drinking either. It'd be, you know, cocaine or whatever it was to get the deal. You know, we, you know, we'd go do drugs together. We'd drink together. That, that whole, that whole thing, you know, it's just still like, like that, by the way. Is it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oil and gas. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, I started struggling. I started moonlighting in a club, uh, a concert venue working security. And I loved it. It just, it gave me a lot of freedom to just be who I was. And, and I didn't have to fake and, you know, or, you know, bullshit someone about what I was trying to sell them. And I really loved it. Uh, I ended up cutting my hair like you see today. This is like mm -hmm. 20 year haircut. <laughs> and because uh, it would get pulled in the, in the, in the concert venue. And I would try and take someone out. They grab my hair. Oh. I went to work uh, to my day job with my suspended suit and, you know, my shiny shoes. And they said I had to grow a part back in my hair. And I was like, what? And so I went to my sponsor in AA and I told them what I was going through. We talked about it. I, you know, I wrote some things about it and I was making good money for a 20, I don't know how old I was, 26 year old, 25 year old and uh, you know, 50 grand a year, company car. Everything, that was back you know, in the eighties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is now it's 91, I guess. And uh, he said, you gotta do what you love. And so on Monday, I shaved my head or Sunday, I shaved my head, took one of my suits. I cut off the bottoms to make it into long shorts, put on some combat <laughs> boots, a band shirt, got my ears pierced. And I, I went to work and I gave him my car keys. I said, I'm done. And I went from making that great salary and having that car to no car and five fifty an hour. And I had never been happier. And I, I had no idea that it would turn into what it is today. You know, I just, it just goes to show you how important it is to do what you love. And I, I went to a meeting shortly after that. And everyone in AA is like, you can't work in a club. You can't be around alcohol. Mm -hmm. And my sponsor had said, and I believe this, we get sober to live our lives. When I was drinking, my life was in a box. I went to New York. I don't know how many times I didn't even, I never went to Central Park when I was drunk. I saw bars and restaurants. That was it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I got sober, I was able to see the museums and everything that New York has to offer. And the same thing with all of my life. So being drunk, I was just... It's like I had blinders on. And uh, so I told people in AA, I'm like, you know, I have a good foundation and this is, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing and this, I'm going to stick with it. And this is what happened. You know, I think uh, being sober has helped to make me a successful uh, 
business owner in the nightclub business. Oh, I, I think that, that there's a you huge advantage in that. Well, you, you see so many. <laughs> well, you, I, I watched the Bar Rescue show uh, with John Taffer. You yeah. seen that one? Yeah. And you know how many people are sitting at their own bar drinking their own booze? And, and you're that's sitting the there, first thing. He's like, what that's the, the first thing. That's, the <laughs> that's money down your throat. Why would you do that? Like, yeah. I, I get it. It, it. it probably did make you a way better business owner and more conscious of that sort of thing. And then when it transfers over into the LS clubs, it probably made you a lot more conscious because are all your clubs uh, BYOB? They are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now you're also more conscious of like the amount of liquor that people bring well, and, in in an evening and, and stuff like that. More conscious of the lifestyle, which I want to get into. Do we have to go to a yes. quick commercial break? Okay, we're going to go to a quick commercial break. When we get back, we'll continue this conversation. All right, cool. Welcome back to <laughs> Sex Uninterrupted with Tar and James. Uh, we have our two amazing guests on the show today, John and Jackie Melfi from Open Love 101. Hey, guys. Hey. So, uh, we are going to be talking about our main topic of today's show, which is booze in the lifestyle. <laughs> booze. The boozes. Boozes. <laughs> All the boozes. And yeah, John was sharing his uh, sobriety story and kind of how it helped him be, well, how it did help him be a better businessman. And I'm, I'm wondering, I'm curious, do you think it's improved your lifestyle experience as well? I know that it's been a while and there's not much yeah. to compare, but well, like, yeah, like I said earlier though, when I was, uh, younger and drinking, I had some crazy sexual experiences, but I never really thought of it as a lifestyle. It was just, that's how I lived my life. And then after being in the nightclub industry, you know, I ended up after I, I was working security in a club and I owned my own club in 1995. And then I started getting involved in swingers clubs around 97. And that's really when I was exposed to the term swinger and the lifestyle and that, that type of, I didn't even know if it was lifestyle back then, I don't remember honestly, but, but that's when I first started having uh, swinger parties. And for me, I don't know any other way. I mean, I just, I know it's, it's, it's awesome because I can, I, when I drank, I would go on dates, whether they were with, you know, a threesome or just, you know, a girl by herself and you pass out, you get too high, you can't get it up. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you forget where you are. You got to call in sick. I don't know. Just all kinds of, just a lot of negative things with me because I was an alcoholic. Now, I mean, not everyone experiences that, that drinks alcohol. Plenty of people can drink socially and not have any kind of problems, but that wasn't my case. Mm -hmm. Right. And so do you, do you find like, did, so you, I guess you did have some lifestyle experiences when you were intoxicated. Do you, do you find now that it's a little bit more enhanced for you? Like you get more of the feel, like you get to maybe remember more and like, I do. Absolutely. Yeah. you remember everything about it. Mm -hmm. And that's the, I, I understand there's some people that may have, a, they may have difficulties being the lifestyle for some reason. And maybe they don't want to remember if that's the case, do they really need to be in the lifestyle? Mm -hmm. um, I want to remember everything, whether it's good or bad. Because if it's bad, you don't want to hook up with them again. And if it's great, you do. And, and you love to be able to share those things with each other about the great experiences you had and being, uh, you know, not even sober, but at least not, not drunk. Well, um, that drunk to intoxication where you don't remember, right? Because like yeah. that's to have to be filled in by your partners would suck because it's their interpretation of the information, right? So, and what went on. So it's like, and even maybe you were in separate rooms or something may happen. So again, all you have to go on is that information and that memory that kind of might put you at like ease if you don't have 100% trust and your partner can be telling you the like, this is what happened because I was with you the whole time I was sober. So that's, that's an interesting dy dynamic. And Jackie, uh, we just found out that you're also sober too. A non-drinker. Non-drinker. <laughs> just a non-drinker. Sorry. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you're a non-drinker. And that also goes to help supporting John in that sort of sense. Yeah, it, it, it really does. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's interesting. He wasn't drinking, obviously, when, when we reconnected. And initially, when we would go out, maybe I would have a drink or so, but it was so weird, like how quickly I realized that I was drinking and he wasn't drinking as far as how I felt. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just like, I was really conscious of the fact that 
He was completely sober. Clear headed, right? Clear headed. Everything that he was getting to experience was really holistic. He was super conscious of what was going on. And, you know, for me personally, there was some value in that. I, I began to realize that that was really something that I admired about him and that I wanted to emulate. You know, I was going to be doing something really different. I really felt like it would probably behoove me to be conscious of what I'm doing. Because when you're, when you're stepping outside of a relationship model that's so different from what you're used to, when you start dealing with things like consent or what uh, your own sexuality, if, if I start covering that up with a lot of alcohol, my ability to make decisions that are going to be in my best interest, that starts to go away. Oh, absolutely. So I really like the fact that every experience that I have had in the swinging lifestyle, I've been 100% conscious in it. Mm-hmm. So I ne- we have never had any kind of an issue where it's like, you know, I can't believe you let that happen to me. You know, you knew I was drunk. You should have been there. Or I don't know what happened to me. I think something may be happening to me. I don't know what's going on. You know, we just, that's, we just took that off the table because we have the power to take that off the table. We don't have to be victim to that. We, we took ownership over those decisions in, in our marriage. And for John and I, it's benefited us. You know, I'm like, John, there's plenty of couples out there that can drink socially and, you know, have, have that one or two drink to kind of loosen up or, or whatever. And that's fine. We definitely are not one to judge anybody of what, what they're doing. Cause no. if it works for them, that's, you know, I'm doing this. This is what works for us. But if you're drunk and you get ready to get sick, uh, I'm not going to have sex with you anymore. I'm going to leave you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, and that, does, that, that, that will affect our decisions on who to play with yeah. as well. Yeah. Definitely. Kind of my, our next question, which is, do you mostly play now with people that are also sober? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think there are plenty of people we've played with that drink. Yeah. yeah. But now if someone's drunk and, you know, how people get really drunk and they, they can start spitting in your face and slurring their words and they're stumbling or falling down, we're not going to play with someone that's, you know, that drunk. Mm-hmm. No. Uh, we have plenty of friends we play with that drink and it doesn't bother me at all. So. Well, and even with that, like when you see somebody that inebriated, the issue of consent also can come into play. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like absolutely. there's times where, you know, we, we definitely have partied and we're exploring um, the lifestyle more sober now, but there's times where I have woken up the next day and I'm like, I don't really remember what happened. And, you know, that's kind of scary. I don't like waking up and feeling that way. No, I guess not. How, so how long have you guys gone without a drink so far? Almost 30 days. Real Okay. And have yes. you had any uh, swinger experiences in that period of time? Yes. And so you remembered them. Yes. Yep. <laughs> well, the, the one thing that I, I, in, since I've probably been like 24, I've never got like inebriated drunk where I can't remember. But I was also, I've also been in stages where I've been inebriated drunk and remembered everything. I was the guy literally weirdly in like university that like my whole house would come to, to ask me what they did. And for some reason I would remember, even though I was intoxicated, I just have this weird thing that when I'm intoxicated, I remember stuff. There's bits and pieces when I'm like really, really there, but I've never really gotten there in the last probably, I don't know, like six years. No, five years, but yeah, but that concept of like always remembering, I, I don't want to be the one telling her because it's also my interpretation, the information, like I said, and I say that I'm like, how do I know that you're, (laughs) that I, I'm like, I got mad. You know what? You made me mad. I know something (laughs) happened. You're leaving a part out. (laughs) And well, of course I'd leave the part out where she got mad at me and because I might have done something wrong, why would I go back to that space that? to go, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put myself through this again because that's what I wanted, right? Because it was so much fun while you were intoxicated. Let's go to the point where you were sober and then you have more feelings about the fact that you were too intoxicated. Great. Yeah, let's go to that. <laughs> 
but I, I think that it also has it's enhanced, been interesting to enhanced that sort of thing because we now are fully into and actually using cannabis for us is also like more into our bodies. So we, we have been sober, semi-sober, as I would like to say, but we've just been non-drinking. And uh, so the smoking is also get, brings us into our bodies and it m- makes us more, I feel, you know, I feel more, more relaxed. I feel less anxiety, way less anxiety. I have like, I'm very prone to anxiety and like the heart palpitations have gone away. The, the thinking I need like that drink to calm me down. Yeah. yeah. It's, it is almost like a panic that it gives you. It's interesting to observe myself during this. Because uh, we definitely know, I, thought about it, thought about drinking. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to do from time to time, really, you know, kind of test what it is that you think you believe about yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, are these things really true? Do I, do I really have to do this thing that I've always told myself I do? Or have I just told myself this for so long? Now I, I think that's really who I am. So well, that's pretty cool. Society really plays up the alcohol. Like, well, and also be, the lifestyle. Like, oh my God. And the lifestyle too. Being a party atmosphere, yeah, right? Like it, it is a party atmosphere, right? Like you do it on Friday and Saturday nights, right? Like it's not your Monday to Thursday sort of thing. It's your Fridays and Saturdays, right? So yeah. what are your big party nights? Fridays and Saturdays. So it becomes yeah. that party atmosphere. And obviously you guys have been in it for how long now together? Seven. Seven plus years. Seven years. So you've been to enough parties to understand that drugs and alcohol are a very, very predominant part of the lifestyle. And some people use it to become more social. Some people use it to make them feel like they need to be comf- or comfortable. Or And some people just do it to fit in. Some take it and to escape. Escape. Or We all understand that people will use drugs and alcohol, I think, in different forms to try to make themselves feel comfortable, but you shouldn't, like you said before, John, you shouldn't have to need alcohol to be in a lifestyle. Right. Yeah. And I think it's important to note that any kind of social gathering, whether it's a swingers club or a football game, a lot of focus is on, on alcohol or anything that's going to kind of affect your mood. Yeah. Nightclubs in general. Yeah. I mean, they roll around clubs, and that's just, yeah. that's, that's the way it is. It's and- society. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I did um, probably six years, seven years ago now, I did a bikini competition. And so I didn't drink for three and a half months. And that was when I was single and in my early 20s. So wow. that was really interesting to navigate um, being that age and being single because everything was just about partying at that point. And yeah. It was really hard to like get out and have fun and really find my groove again. I felt really lost during that time. It is it isn't easy no. to go against the grain with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really so, is really in my sobriety, I would go out I've been sober a little while, I don't know, six, eight months a year, and I went out to a club and I was so uncomfortable dancing, talking to people. The reason I started drinking was so I could fit in and, and it gave me courage. You know, I was, I was a bright redhead in high school, junior high school, and I got teased, and picked on for different things, especially my hair. It made me, I became very shy and introverted, scared in alcohol. The first time I drank it, I remember how much courage it gave me in that people that I was with liked me. And that was the, that was the trigger right there. And then I was off to the races. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can relate. Definitely. And I think that a a lot of people um, have issues. Like I've always thought about issues with alcohol because like, again, being in the lifestyle when you're doing your weekends, it's like, there is that like, like three to five, six drinks that you're sitting there socializing, doing all that stuff. And I, I don't know. I just feel like sometimes it's like, even if I just knock that down to one drink and then a water and then one drink and then a water and just normalize it that way, I'm still getting potentially a buzz if, that's necessary, but like not drinking all obviously is, it is, I feel it, it adds to the lifestyle more. I feel yeah. like I can have these open conversations where I'm talking about things that like really mean some stuff to me now. Right. Like, and I get to open up more about this stuff instead of talking about kind of bullshit just to have a conversation. Right. When you're intoxicated, that little, that verbal diarrhea that just kind of, that I always have, but um, okay. <laughs> he won't. <stop. laughs> 
<laughs> but no, that's good. I think that um, it's nice to provide some advice for people who are like trying to practice drinking less or sobriety in the lifestyle. Um, yeah, the water is definitely helpful. I find one thing that we do too is like try and have like a max and tell each other like, I'm only going to have five drinks tonight. And you know, kind of hold each other accountable for that too, because it is kind of easy in these situations, like especially with shots and stuff that it just gets in your face and you just down your throat. Yeah. You know, alcohol has a ton of sugar in it. So something you can do to kind of uh, alleviate, I mean, when you initially get sober, the withdrawals, or if you're trying to just drink less is candy. Because candy will provide you with that sugar high that you're looking for sometimes in the alcohol. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Mm. Or fruit juice. Yeah, yeah. Fruit juice can do it too. Yeah. 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 You, and we don't drink a lot of pop and stuff. So we probably really feel the sugar and the alcohol. Yeah. Then. Yeah. yeah. So have a Red Bull. Have you, um, <laughs> have you ever done like a dry night at any of your clubs? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Uh, is there, do you, is there a reason? I never thought of doing it. I don't know why I would do it. Right. Uh, let me take that back. We have an event at our in our Austin club. We do. It's called Shrine. It's Sunday once a, once once, once a, month a month on Sunday, and it's a it's really um Shrine is an umbrella for a bunch of subgroups that are into different kinks. So you'll have groups in there that do uh, you know rope suspension, bondage, BDSM, uh, BDSM flogging. Uh, what do you call it? those suits? They wear latex. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. It's an amazing event. I mean, I think last uh, last one we had a couple of weeks ago, three or four hundred people were there. No alcohol allowed in the club. None. And that's based on the promoter that puts on this event. And a lot of that has to do with that lifestyle. It's really important to them that you're completely in control. That you know when you need to, when is enough is enough, and you can say no. Use your safe word. You don't need a drunk person tying you up. No. No, because you don't want that person to pass out while you have a rope around your neck. You know, there's, it really is a safety issue for them a lot of times and a consent issue. It's amazing how smooth that night runs and how we never have to ask someone to leave and they say, we're not going to leave. No. Right. You know, they, they're just normal Very people. Respectful. Oh, my God. It's really, really a good yeah. night. So, so you've, yeah. so obviously you've had some obviously alcohol related issues in your clubs before. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> well, and that's kind of the things. Are, do you have uh, are all your clubs self pour, or do you have somebody pour for you? In in Louisiana, we can pour, and so we do control. If if someone's getting out of hand, our bartenders do control the pours. Yeah. Uh, here in Texas, it's illegal for us to pour. Right. So people have to. They have all. They have all yeah. the control over their alcohol on their own. So I don't agree with it, but it's the law. So yeah. And and you mentioned something good too, is that if you're in the lifestyle exploring kink, really check your alcohol intake, like, because you can do things. (laughs) I've been in that position with booze and kink and afterwards I didn't feel very good about it. You can really hurt somebody. You can really hurt somebody. You, people's pain levels, their thresholds are different. Um, it's just, and, and same with you, you're, how well can you aim a flogger when you're, <laughs> yeah. you know, six, seven drinks <laughs> in, right? Like you can do damage on their kidneys and stuff. So yeah. um, you made a really good point with that. And it's, inter- it's interesting though, that we will see the importance of that from a physical standpoint, but we'll downplay the emotional effects that too much alcohol can have on us. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Our, our decisions, so. I know it's just part of I think raising the consciousness with that too and I agree and I think being role models in it as well like not like showing that we can do this being sober you guys are doing this being sober it's completely healthy and normal to be in the lifestyle sober as well as drinking (laughs) it is and a really interesting point is so I told you I went to a meeting and they told me I shouldn't be doing work in the nightclubs so many years I did, and I cannot tell you how many people would go to one of my staff and say, why doesn't John drink? Oh, he's been sober a while. Really? Can I talk to him about it? And they'll come up and talk and, and you know, can you take me to a meeting? Sure, let's go to a meeting. I mean, it happened every single weekend. One or two people would come up and, and ask mm-hmm. me about how I stayed sober and I would show them or help them, you know, show them the path to sobriety. So it really was, it just, it ended up 
giving me what I love to do and that's help people. Yeah, absolutely. That's so powerful. No, that, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> I don't even have to ask my last question, but what is your advice for people who are trying to practice sobriety in the lifestyle? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I, I really don't judge people. I mean, I don't look at people that are in the club and say one way or the other, what they're, if they're drinking too much or not, it's just the way, it's just the way it is. You know, I just, it, I don't, it will affect me in a negative way if I start judging people in that way. But yeah. if someone literally wants to get sober, first of all, they can reach out to me and I'd be happy to help. Um, for me, the only way was to work a 12 step program. Uh, I know people that have gotten sober in other ways. Um, but that's the way I know and understand. If it's, if you're just trying to, you know, maybe not drink for a month then that's what you do. You just cold Turkey, commit to it and don't drink. I mean, if you, if you aren't able to accomplish that, what's the big deal? You know, mm-hmm. it's, that's only something within yourself that you're trying to, I got sober because if I didn't, I was going to end up in jail or dead. So it was really a matter of life and death for me. Well, and you know, I think too, sometimes we like to think of peer pressure as being something that only those first and second and third graders or the middle schoolers or the high schoolers are dealing with, but adults can deal with peer pressure just as much. And alcohol (laughs) is a perfect example of that. You know, what do you mean you're not drinking? How do you have fun and not be drinking? I'm like, well, how do you have fun and, and be drinking? You know, I mean, (laughs) so it's about, it's about making that conscious choice. I'm not going to drink. And if somebody asks me to have a drink, I just say, no, I I don't, I don't want to, you know, it's just about staying strong in your decision. Because you never know, like John says, you could be that great example for that other person to be like, oh, wait, you mean I don't have to take this shot from this person just because they're offering it? I can say no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. Totally. Yeah. And I, yeah, it goes to that whole point of like, you don't need booze to have fun. Like that's, right. the, that's the question back, right? Like, right. why do you need booze to have fun? Like yeah. is life not is life right now not as entertaining to you? Like <laughs> going to Naughty and Nolens, is this not entertaining to you? Right? Yeah, you feel like, like you're on another planet. Like, like this is a completely different world. Did you mean to tell me that alcohol is gonna enhance this? Yeah. Actually, them drinking alcohol at Naughty and Nolens enhances my well, enjoyment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I get to watch this from people watching this on the try? balcony. This is the greatest. People yeah. watching. <laughs> Oh my God, John! Uh, but thank you guys so much for that wonderful information. We're actually just going to cut to a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to touch on our IG questions that we got from our Instagram followers. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Sex Interrupted with Tara and James. This is our last segment with Open Love 101, John and Jackie Melfi. Hey. 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 <laughs> hey. So, oh, question. I don't even have it in front of me. I have the Tara. questions. Ask the first question, which was like the most asked question ever. Yeah, like this is crazy. This is why we asked you about your clubs. I'm curious to know if there are dry LS events. If so, are they popular? <laughs> like so yeah. many people asked us about this. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's why I was like, I don't know, you could do a coffee down. night. <laughs> <laughs> You Bring know, your own coffee. <laughs> we haven't, like you know, I said earlier, we we have a night that's you know really kink based that's that's uh, alcohol free. Uh, maybe it's something we'll consider. You know, I, I never have because so many people, I mean, you, we watch them come in the doors bringing their alcohol in. Yeah. And I would say 95% of people bring alcohol in. Well, that's because that's what they were trained to do, too. Yes. Right? But, From the beginning. That'd be kind of fun to try it sometime. That's a good yeah, idea. We'll that is it- a good idea. Well, and, you know, here's the thing. Right now, there seems to be a lot of companies that are coming out with non-alcoholic products. Yes. Four places that are specifically catering to people that don't drink yes. alcohol. You know, they call, I think some of them are called like dry bars or, or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe s- people are interested in that, yeah. you know, more vocal about let's have a place where we can go. You know, we still want to go out and hang out, but we don't want to be around alcohol. Of- yeah. yeah. Somebody actually mentioned that to me on Instagram. They asked if there was, they're like, you know, I know that they have like um, gay coffee shops and gay bookstores. They're like, do they have lifestyle ones where there's no booze? And I was like, I don't think so, but that's a, that's a kind of a good idea. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. I, I was even going to say um, the, the, oh, I lost it. Sorry. 
It was I right because I wanted to go first. She squeezed, <laughs> and so she's like, "I get to go." Nonverbal first. cue. <laughs> and I was sitting here like, "I got a good one," and <laughs> oh, wow. yeah. Draft next question. Um, sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, folks. I got a little stone before this one and that one just slipped away. All right. Next question. At what point does consent go out the window when someone is drinking? Well, consent should never go out the window. Yeah. You know, it's really important in our lifestyle today and in life in general, no matter if you're, you know, dating or if you're in the a swinger lifestyle open relationship, Holly, consent is so important. And uh, if, if you feel as though because you're drinking too much, you're not able to, to consent by saying no, if it's something you want to do, it's really important, I think, to look at ourselves and to understand that maybe what we're doing is bad for us, you know, as far as whatever, drinking or doing drugs, and then not able to say no when you need to. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a big point of topic of, uh, and then that's also- Self-realization no, right there. Yeah, right? self-realization, but also like tell somebody around you that's close to you if you are in that state of mind where you don't feel like you can consent. So at least you have somebody that can potentially look out for you, well, right? Because be I know, but in, yeah, in a perfect world, <laughs> I wish we could control everybody and everybody could be sober and think clearly and have level heads, but some people feel like they need it and that's okay. Yeah. You know, the right? other thing too, with the Jackie, I've talked about this before, when it gets to that point, you just have to accept responsibility for yourself and your actions. If you drank and then did something you didn't want to do, that's your responsibility. So rather than beat yourself up about it, you just, it's, it's, it's better just to accept it. So I get drunk. I'm going to do things that I didn't really want to do. And if I don't <laughs> like the fact that I did those things, maybe like John said earlier, then maybe I need to, are, yeah. to look at what I'm doing. I mean, really we're huge proponents of ownership. You know, mm -hmm. when you get to be a hundred percent responsible for your behavior, that's a fantastic honor. You know, this it's your fault or it's your fault that, that doesn't help you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can ask for help. You know, if I am in a situation where I say, you know, John, can you please, you know, help me with this or, or, or whatnot, you know, that can be very helpful. But if I put all of my personal responsibility on John's shoulders, well, I'm, I'm depending on John's train of thought to match mine. Well, we're two different people. <laughs> I mean, how fair is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, do you want me to do the next question? Yeah, sure. I was just looking at it, but I'm like... It's a good one. I usually refuse shots and drinks at parties, but then I feel like I'm left out of things or not invited back in the future. How should I navigate that? Aw, well, that breaks my heart. Maybe they aren't your friends in the first place. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Right? But yeah. I, I think, first of all, sometimes we feel if we're not doing things that people that to fit in in the situation we we feel as though people are going to look at us in a bad negative way but a lot of times that's not reality and so that's something that you know if, if we feel like they're not going to mind back because i'm not doing the shots i mean if that's truly the case then you don't need to be there anyway i mean they're not really your friends and that's probably not what they're thinking though if no. you're still a fun person regardless i think we sometimes overthink those kinds of things yeah. I think that's so true. Yeah. Perception. And this is a great chance for communication. You know, this is the other thing we miss. Like, they probably don't want to hang out with me because I'm not drinking. Well, why don't you just ask them? Does it, really, does it bug you guys if I come along and I'm not drinking? If they're all like, yeah, we can't stand it, then you got your answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's so yeah. mean uh, yeah no we can't stand that you're sober you come over here sober Sally doesn't you get invited don't, you don't bring any booze <laughs> like it's not like I can share a drink with you no I get it but yeah right I mean it's yeah. about, like let's just uh, just ask yeah, yeah it sounds like she drinks right so but in my case there have been times where people felt uncomfortable inviting me to things because there's going to be a lot of drinking going on. They just found out I was sober. They think it's going to make me uncomfortable. They didn't mm -hmm. ask me. And so when it finally comes up, they're like, so why don't you invite me to this poker game you go to? Well, honestly, because there's a lot of drinking going on. We didn't want to, you know, have you be, like relapse. Hey, I'm like, I'm my, I'm responsible for myself. I'm not going to relapse. I just want to go have fun. And if you all are getting drunk, definitely invite me because I want to win your money. 
<laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah, that's why they didn't want to invite you. Because <laughs> you'd be better than all of them if they were drinking. You'd smoke them. <laughs> well, and, and you're also putting yourself in like good scenarios where you know that there's like, if you know somebody there, that's not going to pressure you into drinking, right? Like that's, if you went into like a completely blind poker game and somebody was like, hey, do you want a scotch or do you want like a, a you know, a rum or whatever, it's like there's when you have a support system around you and people around you, I think it kind of makes it better because then you have yeah. somebody who's on your team. Like obviously they are supporting you because they didn't invite you. <laughs> <laughs> right? They're, they're trying to protect you so much that they yeah. didn't invite you. So like chances are if they saw you with a drink in your hand, they would also say something too, right? Like, well, I guess it depends on who it is, but hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> True. I'll call you out, John. <laughs> um. All right, next question. What are some ways to help not drink as much at lifestyle events? Weed. Sorry. <laughs> well, there you go. There's one. <laughs> I don't, we, you know, we've been doing the spritzer water too. Yeah. I don't know. So if you want to act like you're drinking, then so you fit in, you just get a ginger ale and some, you know, on rocks or something like that or whatever you drink. Make sure you put a lime in there in a, in a, in a highball glass. People aren't going to know if you're drinking or not. That can help you fit in better. Mm -hmm. And if you have, you know, if, if you have, an, if you're alcoholic, you're going to have a problem not drinking. So that's a quick sign right there. If you're really struggling with not drinking, there may be something more there to look at. Um, if you're not an alcoholic, it, it really shouldn't be that big of a deal. You know, I mean, I've talked to people all the time. They say, oh, I can take it or leave it. I mean, then, then do. If that's yeah. what you're looking for. I mean, it doesn't matter to me. Once again, I don't care one way or the other. But if you want to go to a party and not drink, then limit yourself, have your partner check each other. Like you were talking, you guys were talking about that, you know, that you guys do from time to time. That's probably the best way. Just keep each other in check, but you don't want to get in a fight over it either. I know. Start yeah. controlling your partner say, Oh baby, you had one too many drinks. Now you're over the limit. You know, fuck you. You can't and, tell me what to do. And yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. We, we did that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, we've been there. Yeah, we learned from that one. <laughs> we like to like fuck it all up and learn from it. And then we're like, hey, we're not going to do that again. And then we'll share it with all of you guys. And then you guys get to learn from our mistakes because we've definitely done that one. I've definitely looked at her and been like, what's that? Should you have this? And I'm like, I'm like, should you have that one? Is are that, you my dad? Is this one? I've seen quite a few. And she'll be like, whatever. I'm having fun. And I was like, yeah, I know. I can tell. <laughs> we're going down this path again. Oh, I, you know, the thing is, when I was an alcoholic, there's no way I would have said to myself, I'm going to go in here and see if I can't drink tonight. It was all about the party. Mm, all that the wasn't even cross my mind. Like, why would you do that? Like, if, someone, if you told me this and I was, I'd be like, why are you trying not to drink? So. No, I get it. And, and again, it goes to the whole lifestyle. It's like people have parties and they tell you, bring your own booze or we'll have booze provided. It's, it's, so like it's all there like, it's pretty self-explanatory the, the lifestyle kind of comes with the party atmosphere and booze is going to come with it yeah. it comes down to a fundamental thing one the choice of being in the lifestyle it's all about choices right choosing to be in the lifestyle choosing to be with the person that you're with choosing to share your your relationship mm -hmm. with other people and choosing to drink or choosing to do drugs well and and awareness that it's going to be there too it's going to be presented to you so i think it's good for couples to have that conversation of what, what are we in the lifestyle for? Is it more of the party? Is it more to be sociable and drink? Is it more to have just like friends that we have sex with? Like, like what is, what do we want to experience and get out of that? And it changes. Like we definitely went from like more of the party couple to more established bonds and friendships and, and, and uh, like doing meditating together instead <laughs> of drinking. So you guys sound kind of boring now. Oh, do we? Thanks, John. Awesome. Thanks, John. Yeah, yeah I'm coming like, over to your house, and I'm gonna have myself a nice spritzer. We have Young Swingers Week in two weeks, so yeah, that's a that's we're we're, we're we're saving ourselves for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that wraps up all of our uh, questions. Okay. And uh, I just wanted to ask you guys. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I'll let, uh, let John answer that, that question. That, that's <laughs> Our dog likes to ask all the questions, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I just wanted to thank you guys so much for joining on us on the show. And I wanted to say, how can people get a hold of you guys? Well, you take it. Okay. You can, um, you can find us at colletteclubs.com. That's our, our clubs. And there's email addresses there for each club. If you want to contact the managers, uh, if you want to contact us personally at openlove101.com, either on Instagram, uh, Twitter, YouTube, you know, it's youtube.com backslash open love. They're all set up the same way. Well, Facebook, Pinterest. Pinterest, any of those places you can message us, uh, at our website, open love one Oh one.com. Uh, you can email us directly from there as well. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you you guys so much again for coming on the show and talking about a subject that I think needs to be talked about a little bit more. Well, we appreciate you asking us to talk about that because I think it's an important issue. Absolutely. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And when do we, when do we get to see you guys next in person? When will we get to see you guys next? Naughty. I don't uh, know. That's oh, a that's year away. Way before too, then. That's, way too far. <laughs> uh, that's way too far. I have to figure something out if that's the next time. I what think so. Through? What part, what part of Canada? Calgary. Calgary. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so here. we're planning on going to Northern Idaho for a ski trip sometime this winter. So maybe we can make a little jaunt up there too. Yeah, Maybe. and come to Banff. Yep. Yes, we like, yes, we like. That's right. <laughs> but anyways, again, thank you guys so much for joining us on the show. And again, thank you to our listeners. Hashtag Sue Crew. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. Uh, we will have our next episode coming out at 3 p.m. Mountain Time next Friday. And until next time. Keep it sexy.